Hi everyone, and today I'm here talking to you about Usher syndrome and IEP considerations. It's a presentation that I've done several times with vision professionals to make sure that they understand some of the considerations um, for children who have Usher syndrome in the classroom. So today I'm gonna to first start with an overview of Usher syndrome, then I'm gonna talk about some challenges, and then I'm gonna get into some strategies and supports, and then I'm going to share resources. What is Usher syndrome? Usher syndrome is one of the most common genetic causes of combined vision and hearing loss for all ages. It's considered a rare or orphan disease. It was first described in 1858 by German ophthalmologist. In 1914, it was named after Charles Usher, a British ophthalmologist who completed the first definitive study. It's considered an auto, autosomal recessive disorder, which means if both parents are carriers of the gene, the children have a one in four chance of having Usher syndrome. Usher syndrome affects males and females alike. It is more common in certain communities such as the Jewish and Cajun communities. How does Usher syndrome present itself? Usher syndrome presents itself differently depending on the individual and the type of Usher syndrome, which I'll get into in a few slides but there are some common characteristics. First off, individuals with Usher syndrome are born with or develop hearing loss over time. As far as vision, vision loss is progressive due to retinitis pigmentosa, where light sensing cells in the retina gradually deteriorate. Night blindness occurs first, which is when what brings most people into the eye doctor, thinking there's something wrong. There's also vestibular issues, which are present in individuals with Usher type one. For children who have Usher type one, they often have delays in sitting, crawling, and walking. My son didn't walk until he was about two years old. So I tell parents of children who are deaf of hard of hearing that notice balance issues, that they might wanna see a geneticist and pursue genetic testing to rule out Usher syndrome. Later in life, individuals experience low peripheral vision or essentially tunnel visions, like seeing through a straw. I'll show some examples in a minute of what I mean. So this is a picture on the screen of normal night vision. It's a picture of a, a black tree on the left-hand side with some stars in, the, in a um, dark sky. And you can see all the white um, specks, which are stars. For someone with Usher syndrome, that's what this picture is. So this is um, a depiction of what this might look like. It's um, a picture, the same picture that was on the screen previously on the, uh, the last slide, but on the left, you can't see any of the tree. You can't tell the tree exists. And the picture is much darker. So instead of like a dark blue sky, it's almost a black sky. And you can see kind of some specks of white, but very few, um, you can't really tell out tell that there are stars in the sky or anything like that. As far as retinitis pigmentosa, um, on this slide, our, um, on the left is a picture of two boys. Two, um, they're both holding balls. And the, that's a depiction of what normal vision might be like. They have a fence behind them. And it looks like they are um, potentially in a playground. On the right hand um, of the screen is the same picture and what this might look like if you had retinitis pigmentosa, which is the eye disorder that those with Usher syndrome have. So in this depiction of this picture, um, it's, it's almost all black and all you can really see are the two boys' faces. Um, you can um, make those out. And so you can see when I was talking about it being, um, looking like you're seeing through a straw, that's, that's what that might look like. So for the hearing loss, hearing loss is often congenital, which means present at birth, bilateral, which means both ears, and sensor neural, meaning no structural damage to the ear itself, only to the sound sensing hair cells inside the cochlea. I'll be showing a short video clip in a moment to describe all of this. Families and individuals have decisions on how they prefer to communicate. It's a very personal choice. Some communicate using American Sign Language or ASL or tactile sign language for individuals who may have less vision or signing exact English with or without speech, which could be called total communication. 
Others may use cued speech, which is a method, method of communication in which the mouth movements of speech are combined with a system of hand movements. And others use spoken language with the help of hearing aids or cochlear implants or a combination. A cochlear implant is a very different from a hearing aid. Hearing aids amplify sounds so that they can be detected by damaged ears. Cochlear implants, on the other hand, bypass damaged portions of the ear and directly stimulate the auditory nerve. My children hear with the help of cochlear implants and use spoken language. But again, it's a very personal decision. And as you work with these families, it's important to understand the communication mode that they have chosen for themselves and their families. It is especially important to understand as you develop an IEP and think about placement and services because the needs vary depending on individual communication preferences and abilities. Teams from um, the state deafblind projects have experience and can help your IEP teams understand communication and hearing loss and how to support a child in the classroom. So it's really important that you have someone on the team who is knowledgeable about deafblindness and can really understand the different communication approaches. So I'm gonna show this video about the ear. Have you ever wondered how sounds make their way from the source all the way to your brain? Take a trumpet, for instance. When it's played, it makes sound waves in the air. The outer ear catches the waves, which then travel through a narrow passageway called the ear canal. The sound waves reach the eardrum, which is a membrane roughly half the size of a dime. They make the eardrum vibrate, which in turn vibrates three tiny bones called the malleus, incus, and stapes. These bones amplify or increase the sound vibrations and send them to the cochlea. The cochlea is shaped like a snail and is the size of a garden pea. It is filled with fluid and the sound vibrations make this fluid ripple, which creates waves. Hair-like structures called stereocilia sit on top of hair cells and are grouped together as hair cell bundles inside the cochlea. The hair cells inside the cochlea ride these waves and the hair bundles are moved. The hair bundle on top of the hair cell turns these movements into electrical signals. As the hair bundles are moved, Ions rush into the top of the hair cells, causing the release of chemicals at the bottom of the hair cells. The chemicals bind to the auditory nerve cells and create an electrical signal, which travels along the auditory nerve to the brain. Different hair cells respond to different frequencies of sound. The hair cells at the base of the cochlea detect higher pitched sounds, such as a piccolo or flute. The hair cells toward the top of the spiral detect progressively lower pitched sounds, such as a trumpet or trombone. At the very top or apex of the spiral, the hair cells detect the lowest pitched sounds, such as a tuba. The auditory nerve carries the electrical signal to the brain, which interprets the messages as sounds that we recognize and understand. Now I'm gonna show a video of what hearing loss looks like in the classroom. This is a simulation of what speech sounds like through a hearing aid. This is what it would sound like if you're an adult with a hearing aid trying to communicate in a restaurant or a cafeteria. You can hear me, but you can also hear all the noise and reverberation, making it difficult to understand my voice. As you move further away from the talker, it becomes even more difficult to understand speech. This is what speech would sound like when listening through a Roger system from Phonak. In this example, we're using the Roger pen. It automatically chooses the correct settings based on the room noise and its position in space. Now you can hear speech much more clearly, making it easier to understand. It will sound clear no matter how far away you are. You can even be 20 meters away and still hear and understand. 
So you can see in that video, the teacher is wearing um, an FM system or a DM system, which is a um, something that um, it's a microphone that she wears and the sound that goes into that microphone and straight to um, a child who has a hearing aid or a cochlear implant. Um, and so they can hear the teacher or whoever's wearing that system um, louder than the background noise. And so one of the things that I think is important to understand is uh, you know, a child could have a really um, good hearing because of the cochlear implants or the hearing aids in a really quiet one-on-one -on -one setting, but you put them in a PE class, a really loud um, classroom, um, some, some situation that's unfamiliar, even with like background noise as far as um, air conditioning units, um, chairs moving, things like that, and it can become really challenging. And so some um, families use um, an FM system like this for their children. Others, um, children may use more than one um, method of communication. So they may be primarily um, using uh, oral and spoken language, but they may find that, you know, um, you know if things are loud, they may rely on um, ASL or some other method, cued speech or something like that, in order to make sure that they have access to all the um, what's going on in the classroom. So I wanted to show also what tactile sign language looks like. This is just a really short video showing you what this might look like. So I hope that that gives you a good understanding of the, all the different types of communication and what this might look like for children that you see um, and work with in the classroom. Going back to the different types of Usher syndrome, I have a chart on the screen showing the different types, um, type one, two, three, and atypical. Um, so when I talk about type one, there are subtypes such as type 1B, which is what my children have. There are more than more and more subtypes of Usher syndrome being identified all the time as doctors learn more about genetics. It's important to note that genetics testing is the only real sure way to confirm the diagnosis. The find it, Foundation Fighting Blindness offers free genetic testing, and I'll be sharing a link at the end of the presentation if families are interested in pursuing um, genetic testing to understand what type of Usher syndrome their child has. Usher syndrome type one, which is what my children have, typically presents as being identified as profoundly deaf early, often at birth. An early onset of RP, which is retinitis pigmentosa. We noticed night blindness, for instance, at the age of three, and my oldest son was legally blind at the age of 16. But again, this varies by individual. So there's no um, you know, common way that this is gonna show up. My 13 year old has some night blindness and blind spots, but his peripheral vision is pretty intact right now. Children with Usher syndrome one are also late to walk, which I described earlier. Usher syndrome type two is characterized by, typically by a moderate to severe high frequency hearing loss, a progressive hearing loss potentially. Retinitis pigmentosa becomes evident in their teens and they will typically not be legally blind until their twenties or forties. Again, it's very individual. Individuals with Usher 2 do not typically have problems with balance. Usher syndrome type 3 is categorized by both a progressive hearing loss and vision loss. Some individuals may have problems with balance. About 50% of those um, with, uh, who have Usher 3. There's also an atypical type in which the gene is present, but the symptoms are absent or do not fully express. As we learn more about genetics, we learn more and more about the atypical types of Usher syndrome and the other three types that I talked about. It's important thing to know that there are subtypes under each of these types, like I mentioned. For instance, for type one, the currently known subtypes are Usher 1B, C, D, F, and G. Each subtype relates to a different gene, which makes it like almost each subtype is a different disorder. Research for a cure for Usher syndrome typically is done by subtype by gene, and each gene has different characteristics. 
So for a family with Usher syndrome type 1B, there's a different gene, for instance, than Usher syndrome type 1F. This means that there is different research towards a cure and slightly different ways that the syndrome expresses itself. Now, again, it's still, you know, all of the research that's being done for a particular subtype is obviously going to help all the other subtypes, but it is very gene specific. So for families with Usher syndrome, you know, having these specific subtypes that have a little bit different characteristics and mean different things for um, research can really make this feel like the disease is even more rare than it already is. The Usher syndrome coalition estimates that there are at least 25,000 individuals in the United States and over 400,000 worldwide who have Usher syndrome. The National Center on Deafblindness and the State Deafblind Projects conduct a child count each year. In 2020, there were 11,407 deafblind children served by states, 413 with Usher syndrome in the United States. There are significantly more children that are not yet in the child count and are not yet counted. It is important to be counted so that we can ensure the services and supports for these children. So now I'm gonna talk a little bit about the challenges. So why is it so difficult finding the children and the adults with Usher syndrome? Well, we don't know for sure, but there are many things that contribute to this. First off, because it's so rare, most medical professionals don't know about Usher syndrome. When they see things like children missing developmental milestones for walking, they don't think to refer them to a specialist or for genetic testing. This is getting better and better with the advances of genetic testing and more awareness, but it's still an issue. Secondly, children with Usher syndrome are often mainstreamed or in a local school with supports. Because their vision loss may not present until later, these children may be classified as deaf of hard of hearing and may have not received, started to receive vision services yet, or be classified as deafblind on their IEP. Thirdly, Usher syndrome might be suspected, but the gene might not have been identified for that child. Number four, the child may not be connected with their state deafblind project, so they're not in the child count. This situation is what I was talking about previously about the discrepancy in numbers. We think that there's more children who are who have Usher syndrome. They're just not identified in that child count that I was talking about. And lastly, it may be that um, these families may have not connected with a coalition and may not be in our registry. All of this is important because we can't provide services and supports if we can't find everyone. Having access to more individuals also helps pharmaceutical companies and researchers prioritize research toward a cure. With increased numbers comes more hope for our community for a cure. There are many individuals and adults with Usher syndrome that haven't been, have only been clinically diagnosed and have not received genetic testing. These individuals are often not in our counts. Another challenge is that Usher syndrome is heterogeneous. Not only is it clinically and genetically heterogeneous, it is heterogeneous when we think about how deaf blindness impacts a child in the classroom. As I mentioned previously, communication modes vary. A child who uses sign language, for instance, will have different needs than a child who uses listening and spoken language, but it may be more complicated than that. A child may use different communication modes depending on the situation. I talked about that a little bit earlier when I was talking about that FM system. For instance, sometimes children who have cochlear implants or hearing aids and primarily use spoken language will find they will benefit from a sign language interpreter or captioning in the class. I hear this a lot when a child is fatigued, for instance. And, you know, I especially heard this a lot during the pandemic where our children found that they needed to rely on multiple modes of communication in order to keep up with the curriculum. Hearing and vision can have different impacts depending on the situation. For instance, um, that video that I showed is was in a quiet, well-lit classroom. A child may not have as many impacts if that classroom is quiet, but if it has chairs moving, lots of talking, air conditioning, running, um, and even with a child experiencing a lot of glare or poor lighting and visual um, access issues, um, that may also impact um, hearing. And it will also depend on how tired a child is or what else is really going on in that child's life. 
So for with a child with an Usher syndrome, vision loss is progressive and hearing loss may be too. So again, what worked yesterday may not work today. And so it requires collaboration and problem solving to continually adjust things. And you know, what works for one child may not work for another because like I talked about, every child has unique needs. And so we need to consider those unique needs. Another challenge is the diagnosis. It's important to understand some background of what parents might be experiencing because their grief cycle may feel like a bit like a roller coaster. First, these families often receive a double diagnosis. Often families notice the hearing loss first and then later find out about the vision piece, the Usher syndrome. It's a double whammy when you think about it for families and you feel, I, I still recall really uh, vividly how just when you get over that first grief cycle about the hearing loss, you find out more. The grief continues on because the vision and sometimes hearing loss is progressive. So you're always grieving a loss of your senses. The grief is not linear and it feels like a roller coaster that you can't get off of. Still today, 20 years later, I still have bad days when this grief hits me because I'll notice that my child's vision has declined again. Or I won't have an answer to how to help them in the classroom um, with something new that popped up for them. Because Usher syndrome can affect everyone differently, the future feels uncertain at times, which adds to the grief. Usher syndrome is rare, so it's hard to find information and find other families and connect with other individuals. That's where the Usher syndrome coalition really can help. When my oldest son was diagnosed, the coalition didn't exist and it was very difficult to connect with others. Thankfully, this is different today, but it's still really, really hard. And lastly, it's hard to find others who understand what you're going through. Um, you know, even just being around people who understand the impact of that diagnosis and that constant feeling of grief and loss over time. In a past study that I, research study I conducted, I interviewed parents, mothers of children who are deafblind about their IEP experiences. What I found is these parents, in addition to some of the other common challenges that parents face in IEP meetings that we all have heard about, have some Usher syndrome specific challenges. The challenges common to other parents include IEPs being stressful, especially during transitions, the special education system being overwhelming and confusing, feelings of power imbalance when parents and other IEP team, between parents and other IEP team members, and the resulting conflict that can occur when parents really feel like their voices aren't heard. So parents with Usher syndrome obviously have those same feelings. But for families with children who have Usher syndrome, um, these parents reported some other common challenges. The first is that families feel like professionals often misunderstand their child's needs. This happens because of the reasons that I talked about when I mentioned how heterogeneous Usher syndrome is. So families feel like it's up to them to push for services, especially for those they feel like will help their child in the future, such as braille, orientation mobility, et cetera. Which is sometimes a challenge because if you're working with an IEP team who, um, and you're, you know, you have a child um, who you know in five years may start having a vision loss, you know, many times these children um, don't have anybody even um, a teacher of the visually impaired on the IEP team until they start to have some vision loss. And I think it's really important to make sure that we have all the professionals on the team at a young age, even if we have, even if we start with that child and just have a consult on a, you know, regular basis, because it's important for, you know, the families to kind of prioritize and think, when do I want to start Braille? When do I want to start orientation and mobility? Because you don't want to start, um, you know, those services when, you know, it's, it's so late. So, you know, introducing the cane, for instance, we started to introduce the cane um, at a young age so that my son could get used to it. So my son got his first cane at the age of two, um, still today at the age of 14, he doesn't really need to use it, but he knows how to use it because he's been, you know, working on these skills since he was young. <clears throat> Families also report that the IEP experiences improve if they're able to involve their child in educational planning. 
This is possible if we're able to foster a child's self-advocacy and self-determination skills. So, you know, a lot of the families that I talked about mentioned how much easier it is when their children were able to really advocate for themselves and make their own choices. And so that didn't happen without the entire team, the family working to build and foster those skills. Parents in my study also shared how hard it is to connect with other families, the emotional impact of the diagnosis, like I just talked about, and constantly advocating, and that these impacts are felt by the entire family, not just the parents. So, you know, when I think about it, I think about the siblings. A lot of families, um, the extended family really gets involved in all the education and um, health needs of the family. Parents also shared how IEP team members often did not understand and value different communication modes. I talked about some of the complexities and um, earlier in the presentation um, and how it's such a very personal decision, um, you know, and especially how this can be impacted when a child is fatigued. So it's really sometimes hard when you think about it in the classroom where gosh, you know, a child yesterday was just feeling, um, you know, hearing really well, could understand what was going on in the classroom. Then maybe the child didn't get a good night's sleep and is just tired when they come in the next day. And then, you know, they're working so hard to hear and see and, and compensate for those um, senses that they're just exhausted by the end of the day. And, um, you know, they start missing a lot of what's going on in the classroom. And that can be a real challenge. For Usher families, um, also the teens are often quite large. So, um, you know, a lot of different service providers. And so that requires a really strong collaboration and teaming among different, um, all the different IEP members. And oftentimes those service providers are often itinerant. And so it makes it even more challenging for the team to um, work and communicate together. Transitions are also a big challenge for families, not just the age of, at the age of 16, as most of us think when we talk about like post-secondary transition, but when a new IEP team member is added, when they're new general education teachers, a new school year, et cetera. So that's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about transitions. Um, I'm not talking about just post-secondary transition, any transition. Um, and so this is why many families like, our, like ours create about me one pagers, do in-service trainings with um, the classroom, the students to explain Usher syndrome and their child's unique needs. The support needs could look different, for instance, in various environments. Um, like I mentioned, for instance, in a well-lit, quiet environment when a child is not fatigued, fewer accommodations might be necessary. Um, but if this isn't the case, the child may benefit from things like larger print, closed captioning, and more um, accommodations than they may need uh, if they were in a one-to-one -one or quiet setting. So I want to offer some strategies for supporting families. I'm sure you're doing many of these things already, so there'll be reminders. So first, educate yourself about Usher syndrome. Listening to this video today is a great step in doing that. And then don't be afraid to ask parents because as I stated earlier, each child has unique needs and parents are the most knowledgeable about their own child. And just because you may have worked with a child with Usher syndrome before, doesn't mean that what worked for them will work for a different child. Secondly, meet families where they're at, build those strong relationships. Families may not be ready for resources or certain supports yet, and that's okay. Use a conversational approach with them to figure this out and let them know you'll be there when they're ready. Um, empower families to be strong advocates for their child. Do everything that you can to like make sure their voices are heard. Connect families with organizations that can support them. I'll be sharing resources at the end of this presentation that can help you do that. Find ways to connect them with other families and adults with Usher syndrome, because that can be really helpful. Each summer we have a um, Usher syndrome conference, which is a good way to um, facilitate those connections. But there's also a lot of virtual ways as well. Provide resources, again, when families are ready. And just remember that you don't need to know it all. If a family sends you an email with a question, it's okay to say that you don't know and you'll have to resource, uh, research it because you know, it's just important to collaborate and make sure to build those relationships. 
These are some strategies that the family shared with me as part of my research study. Ensure someone with deafblind expertise is on the IEP team. If there isn't one in your district, you can reach out to your deafblind program staff and they will be likely to be able to provide technical assistance or support. Encourage and make families and parents feel comfortable sharing the knowledge about their child's unique needs and deafblindness, because oftentimes families are very knowledgeable about deafblindness, Usher syndrome, and their unique child's needs. And make sure that they feel like they play an important role on the team, particularly sharing that knowledge, giving feedback and problem solving as necessary. Understand that the impacts of deafblindness are not just deafness plus blindness. When a child has a dual sensory loss, I like to think of it as deafness times blindness, because when you think about like having challenges in both the hearing and the vision together, it can really compound in the classroom and cause challenges if you don't have the proper um, accommodations and supports in place. And you can help families with an in-service about deaf blindness and Usher syndrome involving the child when you can. I talked about many families doing, um, putting together one pages, um, kind of taking some of what's in the IEP, um, putting a picture of what works, what are, what are some of the things that the child enjoys, um, what types of strategies and supports have worked in the past in the classroom. And um, so it just gives that one pager sort of uh, view of how, what works and doesn't work for the child um, that a teacher or anyone, you know, substitute or anything can, can review and um, be able to better understand. Ensuring the IEP team creates appropriate goals. Many parents have told me that they feel like IEP teams often lower expectations for their children and underestimate what's possible. I hear things like, honors classes are not appropriate for children like yours. Your child does not have the communication skills necessary to do a certain task. I also hear a lot about enough, not enough future focus on goals. Um, this is especially true for young children who may not be legally blind, but the parents know that they need braille, orientation mobility, assistive technology, et cetera, in the future. Also, families don't know what they, the expanded core curriculum is, and once they become knowledgeable, they are often interested in including goals in these areas. Helping students self-advocate for themselves is also really important. When I was in the IEP meeting when my son was nine, I was advocating for a teacher of the deaf to be added to the team. I was getting pushed back and I was really frustrated. I could see my son in tears each night needing more support, but honestly, I couldn't get the team to understand because what they were seeing at school was very different than what I was seeing at home. I took a deep breath and thought I'd work with him so that he could explain himself what was going on. He shared his concerns and the team better understood. As a result, he got what he needed. He got that teacher of the deaf on the team. And I felt great that I was able to step back and just support him in his advocacy. So that's just one example. And then lastly, give yourself grace. Parents don't expect you to have all the answers. What does Usher syndrome look like in the classroom? Many children who have Usher are in a gen ed classroom. To be able to access the gen ed curriculum with their peers, they need services and supports. It's not a one size fits all approach and due to the, prog the progressive vision and hearing loss, services and supports will need to be constantly evaluated and readjusted. Determination of proper seating in the classroom is a team effort too. Depending on the classroom and the child's needs, there's not a clear cut answer. For the hearing loss, you know, a teacher of the deaf may come in and suggest that a child be seated closer to the interpreter or in the center of the classroom so that they can hear their peers better. However, the teacher of the visually impaired might come in and say something completely different. And they might suggest that the best place would be in the front of the classroom to allow for best visual access. So you can see how having both the vision and hearing loss, these team members are, and the gen ed teacher are going to need to problem solve and really try out different classroom seating arrangements to see what works. Because also you're not gonna wanna place a child who has a hearing loss near 
an air conditioning unit, you don't want the child to be looking straight out the window where there's a bunch of glare and things like that. You want to make sure they're in a well-lit, um, good place in the classroom where they can hear and see as best as possible. Pre-teaching is also help for these, helpful for these children and checks for understanding because students don't know if they missed something or they didn't see or hear it. Um, this is what was happening for my son when he was in fourth grade. He was smiling and happy at school, but honestly, he was just lost. The teacher would ask him if he needed help, and he didn't really think he needed help because he didn't know what he had missed in the classroom. So for the teacher, it's knowing how to ask detailed questions, asking, you know, checking for that understanding that really helps you determine if a child is missing information. If you just ask if a child has questions, they may respond no, which is what happened with my um, son. But they still may have missed a lot of verbal or visual information. If, on the other hand, you ask them to repeat what their assignments are or what they heard, they, you may quickly realize that they may not have understood. Balancing services and needs can also be challenging. I talk a lot to newly diagnosed families who want all the services right away. And I totally understand that need, but it's also, make, it's also important to balance and make sure that you enjoy those early years with your child. And you, know, you also wanna make sure that your, the children aren't pulled out as much, they miss out time with their peers. And so you know, figuring out the right time for services is just something to talk to parents about and you know, figure out what works for that particular family. One of the biggest challenges is auditory and visual fatigue. If you recall me talking about it's deafness times blindness, um, that's what I'm talking about because having a dual sensory loss in the classroom can cause enormous amount of fatigue. I believe the fatigue can often be compounded. Um, I did a study on the impact during COVID and auditory and visual fatigue is a, is a major finding there. Fatigue also might get worse as the year goes on. Things might sail through just fine until around winter break. And then after coming back from break, things may start to break down. My youngest son is experiencing this now, in fact. When he's fatigued, all systems that we may have in place start to break down very quickly. It's important to have a plan in place for when this happens. And so this is where accommodations come into play. They're so vital, and I find that it's very helpful to look at these constantly, not, at, not just as an annual IEP meeting, but as a situation changes. On the next slide, I'll be sharing a great accommodation resource. So this is a list of accommodate, this is an accommodation resource from our friends at Ava's Voice. I know this is small font and you can't read the details, but I like this resource and I'll share a link to it. It gives ideas for accommodations and it's broke down between in-person and remote instruction. It also lists some of the most common service providers and additional support staff that may be on the teams. This resource can be found using a link on my Lane of Inquiry website or on Ava's Voice website, in addition to the resources um, part of this presentation. So if a child is fatigued or a situation changes where the vision or the hearing changes, it's really important to go back to this list and identify if changes need to be made. So now I'm gonna share some Usher syndrome specific resources. So the Usher Syndrome Coalition is a repository of resources and support for those with Usher syndrome. We are focused on just on Usher syndrome worldwide on all ages and all types. We provide information, resources, and support for all of our community. We don't fund research, but we serve a bridge between the research community and the Usher syndrome community. The coalition connects families and individuals together as well. If you have families you work with, I'd encourage them to sign up for the Usher Trust Registry, which is our patient registry, and to get on our mailing list. We use the registry to let individuals know about clinical trials and we use it to connect our community and to get relevant resources out. I've been working with the Usher Syndrome Coalition since the inception um, back in 2007 and I'm currently the chair of the board and we have a great staff that's here to support any needs that you or any of your families uh, may have. 
Here are some links to information that I feel is relevant. Um, the coalition puts on an annual conference, what I talked about earlier, and this is a great opportunity for families to meet other families and adults who have Usher syndrome. We have an email group for a community called the Ush Blue Book, and we have information on genetics testing on our website. And that includes that link to the free genetics testing for families. We have Ush Talks or short webcasts about relevant topics, information in an ASL format on the website, and a blog. We are also building our community of ambassadors who are volunteers that educate the community about Usher syndrome and the Usher Trust Registry. They provide information and resources and connect others in their state or country. <clears throat> there are also uh, resources and supports for on our website for young adults with Usher syndrome. Um, there are uh, there's a Facebook page for young adults. And um, they're actually having a young adult get together at this year's Usher Syndrome Conference. Also for children with Usher Syndrome, um, Avert's Voice, the um, organization that put together that accommodation resource, puts together Usher this summer camps um, that um, would be a great opportunity for children with Usher Syndrome to connect with others. Uh, Avert's Voice also puts together a Usher Hangouts um, which is an opportunity at the annual conference for children to meet other children with Usher syndrome. The Usher syndrome coalition is also putting together a mentor program uh, and more information will be coming about that soon. We also have many national partners at the coalition. Um, Ava's Voice, um, as I said, puts together one week summer camps for youth with Usher syndrome, supports for families and parents, and, and they also have excellent educational resources. Here See Hope Foundation is our foundation, my family's foundation that we started in 2004. Um, and Lane of Inquiry is the organization that I also started in 2020 that focuses on um, education resources and special education. Um, these organizations raise awareness for Usher syndrome. Here See Hope funds the research for a cure and like I said, Land of Inquiry focuses on special education, deafblind specific research and family support. The Usher 1F Collaborative um, is focused on finding a cure for Usher Syndrome 1F. Like I mentioned, um, you know, all this research has um, implications for other different types. So, um, you know, just because a family doesn't have Usher, for instance, 1F doesn't mean that the, um, it's also important for them, also important to share what's going on with the Washer 1F community so that you might, um, you know, that might give them hope for the future if there's something going on there. Usher Syndrome Society um, uses photo and video journalism to raise awareness about Usher Syndrome, and they also fund research. There's also um, uh, some other national resources um, for um, deaf blind. The National Center on Deaf Blindness has a lot of parent and educator resources on various topics. Uh, the National Family Association for the Deaf Blind, um, one of the things that they do is facilitate family to family community calls. I am currently um, a co facilitator for an advocacy call um, through the National Family Association for Deaf Blind or NFADB. Uh, there's also the State Deaf Blind Project for Children Birth to 21. Um, that can be a good resource if there's not someone who understands deaf blindness on the IEP team. Uh, these deaf blind, deaf, state deaf blind projects can provide technical assistance to IEP teams and educators who may need support. And then Helen Keller National Center for Deaf Blind Youth and Adults is also a good resource. So if you have any questions at all, you can reach out to me and I would be happy to um, you know, reach out to you and provide resources